morning, Southside. I'd like to give a special greeting to anyone who might be visiting us here this morning. We're grateful to have you come worship with us here uh, at Southside. Just a couple announcements as we begin. Um, I wanted to also add about that concert. We'll be taking up an offering to try to help get this school off the ground. So if your heart is led to help with some of those startup costs and you want to give toward that school, um, it would be greatly appreciated. And at that concert, we will take an offering as well for that. Uh, July 31st uh, is a Wednesday. Uh, where there's a new community group that's going to be starting at Nate and Tiffany's house, the Matthews. Uh, they live in Parker. And it's going to be a, a focus. Uh, the first session is going to be on marriage. And it's going to be, you know, we're just kind of looking at what, what Nate and I are kind of talking about, what, what we wish we would have known when we started out. And so just kind of guiding through the Word of God how to grow deeper. And then after that, we'll, we'll break into some parenting. But what, what the goal will be is every two weeks. So it won't be every week. It'll be every two weeks. Uh, it's just a community group. I think what I've learned in my journey uh, is not to start, hey, we got a, a young marrieds group. Um, I, we're just a community group. I, I want to keep breaking, keeping the body of Christ one, working together. So it's just for anyone who uh, would like to be a part of that. I think they need to have kids five and under. Uh, I'll give more details as we go, but I just wanted you to mark your calendar uh, if anyone would like to be a part of that. Uh, special thank you to Royce, who brought us the Word of God last week and encouraged my own heart greatly. And so just um, thanking the Lord for what he did through our brother. This morning, we're going to come to a passage to once again stare your eyes out at Jesus Christ, who's altogether lovely. And so may the mind that was in Christ Jesus be in us, which comes to the indwelling Holy Spirit who will point us to Jesus. And we'll close our time in his word this morning at the communion table, remembering our dear Christ. So let me read our passage, and we'll pray. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, read verses 9 through 11, where we left off two weeks ago. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for where all of history is moving. It's moving to everything that's ever been created, confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord, and it will be to the glory of our God and Father. Lord, we thank you for this plan. Of, of redemption and how you are working in this history, why you created this history and where you will sum it up. You'll sum it up in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray as we come to this exalted high place to stare at Jesus Christ this morning, I pray, Holy Spirit, illuminate our minds to see him, to understand these truths and to worship. I pray, God, that um, our hearts would see that you alone get the glory not us. Bring humility to every heart in this room, God. Let us stare our eyes out at Jesus and let us sit in the proper place at his feet, worshiping. God, I think of the demoniac. We're in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. God, give us that sanity. Give us that understanding and that rightness to worship at the feet of Christ. Lord, use this morning's message to produce the fruit that the Holy Spirit was doing through the Apostle Paul in penning these, verse, these 11 verses in Philippians. God, let that fruit be in every heart this morning, I pray. Amen. In Philippians 1.27, Paul told us to conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we've been looking at what is a worthy manner of such a high, glorious, beautiful gospel? How do we live in a manner worthy of this gospel? And Paul is telling us 
it, it comes in this, this unity of the Spirit and the body of Christ. And as we're seeking out this unity to advance the gospel, it's not just to sit and admire the unity. It's so that all the pieces will work together in the gospel of Jesus Christ going forth into hearts and changing and transforming lives. And Paul says, as we do that, we're going to have two oppositions that are going to come against our unity. And the first one is from outside the body of Christ. There'll be those who hate this message and they hate the messengers and they will persecute you and they will come after you and say all kinds of evil and cast insults against you. And, and Paul's saying, count it a blessing that you've been given a gift to believe and you've been given the gift to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. And so he's encouraging our hearts to not be deterred from the persecution. It is a high honor to suffer for the one who suffered in your place. Consider it a gift. And so it's a, a calling to strengthen us and encourage us as we go out and this message will be rejected. And then he moves into the other enemy that will fight against the unity of the body of Christ. And we saw that this is going to come from within the church. So we have the, the battle without and we have the battle from within because of remaining sin and the terrors among the wheat that will be in the church. And so Paul moved into Philippians 2 to tell us about uh, how to battle this difficulty within the body of Christ. And first, he gave us a prerequisite. And we saw that this first-class condition is because you have encouragement in Christ. As you sit here this morning, is there any greater statement that we have encouragement in Christ? He's such an encouragement. And we have the consolation of the love of God. We have the fellowship of the Spirit, and we have affection and compassion from our God. Those are the prerequisites for unity that you've tasted of the gospel, you know him, you're at peace with God, and you're enjoying him. That must be the prerequisite. It's believers. And then the pursuit as we gather together is verse 2, make my joy complete by being of the same mind maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on this one purpose of lifting up the name of Jesus Christ in this gospel. So we've tasted of it. We come together with this one purpose. I want to make much of Jesus Christ. I want to lock shields and join hearts and lift up the name above all names. And that should be an easy pursuit, but then he moved into what are the poisons that hurt the church and cause a problem to this unity. <clears throat> he told us in verse 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. And we saw this empty glory. This, we, were, we were made to reflect and glorify God, and because of the fall, we're empty now. We're weightless, and we want to have weight. We want to have people make much of us. When someone steps on our toes, we have such an inflated ego that we cannot bear it. We can't let love cover a multitude of sin. We want our way. We want our name, our reputation, our service to be exalted. And so we have this remaining sin that still wants glory. We want to be something. We want to be somebody, and it, it comes into the body of Christ, and it will cause division and hurt and pain and rejection. And so these poisons of self are what hurt the body of Christ. And God has given us a provision, and he said it's, it's humility. And there's not one person who's ever been born with humility since Adam sinned in the garden. You must be born again to have humility. And humility is now that there's a weightiness that I'm a child of God. I am loved by God. I'm redeemed. And, and so now I'm full and I'm filled with what I have in Christ. And I don't chase this world trying to find my glory. Now I've been born again and my whole life has changed that I just want to reflect and give God glory. To be born again went from self-glory so now my life is to exalt God's glory. That's the reason we exist. And that's where this whole passage will be moving. And so humility, we said, is what you look at. And you're done looking at yourself and your own glory. And now you're going to stare your eyes out at Jesus Christ. And so humility isn't, I'm the worst person in the world. It's that Jesus Christ is the best thing ever. And so humility is someone who's just taken up 
in Christ. And I, I don't spend all my days thinking about me and all my needs and just me, me, me. I found something better. And now I look my eyes out at the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we moved into the pattern of what we're to look at. And that's in verses 5 through 11. There's only one thing that can break our love of self and self-glory. You cannot do it in your own strength and cleaning yourself up. The only way to break this is by staring at Jesus Christ. And so we looked at verse 5, the heart application of this whole passage. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. You'll, you'll never look out for the interest of others over your own without this. So get this attitude in yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus. Well, what attitude was it that was in Christ Jesus? So there's our exhortation, and then Paul gives us the example of Christ. Here's what was in the, the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, although he existed in the form of God, he was the second person of the Trinity, he was God, and he did not regard equality with God a thing to be held onto or to be grasped. But what did he do? He kenosis, he, he emptied himself. And he emptied himself, but how? By addition, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a bondservant. He became a doulos, and he was made in the likeness of men. The infinite took on the finite. What a plunge from being worshipped in glory as God into this infinite chasm of being born into a manger. And now he has found an appearance as a man. And so here's the application. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, goes down the Via Della Rosa. He, he goes to the path of, of the cross to die on our behalf, and he's just shamed, mocked, ridiculed. They, they, they make fun of every office. They, they punch him and say, tell us, who prophesy, who hit you? They put a thorn on him and mock him as a king and as a priest. You saved others. Come off the cross and save yourself. It's just a big mockery and jeering of the Son of God. And now we'll come to the exaltation of Christ. So we left them last time in the deepest humiliation that ended in a grave, dead. Now we'll look at the, humili the exaltation. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, in the Greek, this is uh, therefore, and we always ask ourselves, what is it therefore? And I like the way the New American Standard translated it, for this reason also. For this reason of what Christ has done. So usually the way Paul uses therefore, if you'll remember back to Romans chapter 12, is in light of the gospel realities of what God has done in Christ. Therefore, this is how you're to live. This is how you're to respond to the gospel. But that's not the case with the therefore that is before us this morning. This is based on what Christ has done, and this is how the Father then has responded to the humiliation of Christ. The therefore is because of what Christ did in verses 6 through 8. The Father responded in the right way and the right manner. He did what was most glorious. Because of the Son's humiliation, God the Father exalted him and gifted him with the name that's above every name. The Greek is he, he highly exalted, he hyper, hyper, he, he super exalted him. In Acts 2.32, this Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. Ephesians 4.10. He who descended is himself also who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Hebrews 13.20. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Hebrews 2.9, we do not see him who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus. Because of the suffering of death, he was crowned with glory and honor that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. John 10.17, Jesus said, for this reason, the father loves me because I laid on my life that I might take it again. That is why the father has exalted him. How else do you respond to Philippians 2, 6 through 8? How do you respond to a son like that who went from the highest place to the lowest to do the Father's will? And he did it perfectly. And he did it by humbling himself. And so the Father lifted him up and gave him all glory and honor and praise What joy and delight the Father has in His Son. He must be exalted. And when you see this by the Holy Spirit, as we saw last week, it's called faith. When you see this, it begins to change your life and transform it. That Jesus should be exalted above all. Your heart says, yes, yes. And as you stand under the glory and the weight of this, and try to reason what Jesus has done and where he's exalted, and to say this world and my family and the church and the the office should just make much of me, it just rings hollow. That's a sounding, resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. It's so out of tune, my dear brethren. Do you you see this? He's, He's been so highly exalted for what he did. And to sit here and say, life should be about me is the peak of depravity. Come with me this morning to look at the exaltation of the humble one, the humble king. What a therefore. What a therefore. How beautiful to see Jesus highly exalted. Because of what he did, therefore, the Father lifted him as high as he could possibly be lifted. And as we move this morning, I want to make one observation from the text. The source of all this exaltation this morning is God the Father. And so in verses six through eight, you'll notice he did this. He humbled himself. He emptied himself. And now you come to verses nine through 11, and it says, so God exalted him. God the Father raised him up. God the Father did this. So Jesus did all the humbling And the Father did all of the exalting. And as we journey to get to the application, that's going to be a very important point. Christ humbled himself and the Father exalted him. That's where we'll get the pattern for our own life. So the source of this exaltation is God the Father. And now I want to look at the gift of this exaltation, if you'll come with me to verse 9. For this reason also, therefore... God highly exalted him, and he bestowed on him the name which is above every name. This word bestowed means to to graciously give. Um, It carries the idea of wholehearted. Uh, He wholeheartedly uh, gave him the gifts of exaltation. The the Father exalted him with his whole heart. Enter into the joy of the Father. I love how happy and blessed the Father is with His Son. It's emanating from this passage and from the whole Bible that that God is happy and delights in His Son and what He has done, and He just lifts Him up and bestows wholeheartedly all of this on His Son. So what did He bestow? Well, He bestowed the name that is above every name. And so what is that name? He, He already has some names. He was given the name Jesus by the angel when Mary was pregnant. You shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So he already has that name. That can't be the name that we're looking at this morning. He has the name Messiah. He's the promised deliverer. He's called the Son of Man, the Son of God, a prophet, priest, and a king, the Alpha, the Omega, the Door, the Good Shepherd, the Way, the Truth, the Life, the Bread of Heaven, the Living Water. There's so many names that have been given to Christ, but now we're told there's a name that God bestows upon him that's above every other name. It's, it's over every other name. And I was just thinking back through, through history of, of, the, of the Bible historically. You know, Abram had his name changed 
to Abraham when he was brought into a unique relationship with God. Jacob was, was changed to Israel. Saul of Tarsus is Paul. Simon is now Peter. <clears throat> These new names are given to mark out a definite stage in a person's life. And now he gives to Christ a name that is above every name at the culmination of his work of redemption. But my question is this, his name was God. He existed in the form of God we saw two weeks ago. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's the eternal God. How, how could you go higher than that? What, what is this? Well, he bestowed on him the name that is above every name, and, and that name in our text is Lord. He, he's, he was always God. The Father formally now and officially raises him up, puts him at his right hand, and, and officially gives him the name to the exalted God-man. He, he, he's now the God-man who's come back into glory. Christ didn't just return in the same condition as when he left glory. He comes now to glory as the eternal God-man who came and did the work of redemption. In his humiliation, he took humanity without giving up his deity. We, we looked at that clearly. In his exaltation, he takes the title Lord of Lords without abandoning his humanity. So he takes it on and he stays human. He is the exalted God-man. He has two natures, divine and human. He was taken up into glory in this uh, resurrected condition. And he will forever be the God-man. He'll be worshipped for all of eternity as the Lamb of God who laid his life down for us. He will be the subject of worship for all of eternity. I just went back to Revelation 5, 11. Listen to this. John says, I looked. And I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. And they're just saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And they just keep worshiping the God-man. As he has humbled himself to the point of death, God has raised him up to the highest place and gave him this name in light of his work of redemption, Lord. And so I want to look at this name a, a little bit this morning. Come mine gold with me. The Greek word is kyrios. And it was used by Roman citizens to acknowledge the rule of Caesar. They would actually deify the emperor in a ceremony and this name would be given to them. And it was kind of a test phrase to check the loyalty of the people. And they would say, Kyrios Kaiser, which meant Caesar is Lord. And there were Christians in the early church that were being killed if they would not say that. And they would say, no, Jesus is Kyrios. And when you come to the translation in the Hebrew, it's the word Adonai, which is my Lord or my God. And that Adonai was replaced with the personal name of God, the name that we know so well of, of Yahweh. And it's the four consonants that were unutterable. Uh, and they, they were even excluded when they would copy them in, in the translations of the Bible. And so the Jew would not take that name upon his lips. Instead, they would say Adonai, which would be synonymous with Yahweh, Jehovah. And what this meant to the Jew was very clear. And now Jesus comes to earth he goes up on a cross, he goes to the grave, and he's lifted up to the highest place. And now this name is bestowed upon him by the Father. Jesus Christ is kurios. So he went from doulos, the humiliation, to kurios, the name that is above every name. Our Savior, the sovereign of the universe. I want you to listen to the testimony of Scripture. Ephesians 1.19, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. 
and he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. It's no small fact that Jesus is called Lord 747 times in the New Testament. When we speak of coming to Christ for salvation, we come to the exalted one. We come to the Lord. And he's not still hanging on a cross or a baby in a manger or a good example. He is the risen Lord with sovereign power to dispense and save all who will come to him for salvation, even this morning if you need to come to this Christ. All are in subjection to him and all authority has been given to him on heaven and earth. That is who is ruling over his church and that is who we come to when we're saved. And so I want you to hear this. You don't make Jesus Lord. God already did. And you come to the Lord Jesus Christ with a bowed knee and a surrender. In Luke 2.11, the angel says, Today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. In Acts 2.36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? In Acts, Jesus is refer referred to as Lord 92 times. Romans 10.9, Paul said, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is kurios, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Romans 14, 9, For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord, both of the dead and of the living. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom are all things, and we exist for him. And there's one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, we don't preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Kyrios and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. He has been lifted up with the name above every name. Revelation 17, 14, these will wage war against the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings and those who are with him are the called and the chosen and the faithful. I think of Paul when his name was changed, he was going to kill all the Christians and he had a fury to put them to death. And on the Damascus road, he sees Christ and he says, who are thou? Curios? And he finally realizes I'm persecuting the name above every name. And I'm killing people for professing that name and swearing allegiance to him. So we can't leave Christ in his humiliation. The glory of the church is that he is exalted with the name that's above every name. So as he is a sovereign king, he's able to be a savior. And this is so important that God's sovereignty is not to sit around and debate if there's lightning going on the ocean right now that nobody can see. Is he sovereign over that? But it's that it's revealed in scripture and it means he's a God who can save and bring about his purposes in redemption. And so I love when I hear my Savior is Kurios. He's the Lord. My heart has been melted with joyful delight to bow to his Lordship. The greatest burden in my life is remaining sin that fights the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself to the point of death on a cross. So the source of this exaltation is God the Father, the gift is that the Father bestowed on him the name which is above every name, Kurios. And now I want to look at the response to this exaltation, if you'll look with me in verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus, <coughs> every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and those who are under the earth. And so just notice, just a little exegetical call. It does not say at the name Jesus, but at the name of Jesus, which in our text here is Lord. And all are going to bow before his lordship. This is all the future 
And this is talking about the summing up of all things in Christ, the glorious eschaton of where God is moving our history. And some have said this is when he goes from invisible lordship to visible lordship. So he's, he's now ruling and reigning, seated on the throne. And this name has been given to him and all authority has been given to Christ. And he is bringing about his salvation purposes as the gospel is going into the nations and gathering his elect. And until the last will be gathered. And when it is, he's going to come again. And the verse that Paul grabs is amazing. Uh, uh, go to Isaiah 45. Your Bible should be warm to that from this morning. <clears throat> Paul's going to quote from Isaiah 45, and it's, it's worthy to come and just take a look at this this morning, and then we'll go to the table after we make some application. So he quotes from Isaiah 45, Verse 23, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear allegiance. And they will say of me, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. Men will come to him and all who were angry at him will be put to shame. And the Lord, all the offspring of Israel will be justified and more glory. And so in Isaiah 45, flip over just one chapter. <coughs> I'm sorry, stay in Isaiah 45, verse 5. I am the Lord, and this is Yahweh. I'm the Lord, and there's no other. Besides me, there is no God. And I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising and the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I'm the Lord who does all of these things. These idols are just wood that can do nothing. I am God. Look at verse 21. Declare and set forth your case. Indeed, let them consult together. Who has announced this, for, this from of old? Who has long since declared it? Is it not I, the Lord? And there's no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There's none except me. Go to Isaiah 46, 5. To whom would you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we would be alike? And then he goes into these idols. Look at Isaiah 46, 10. This Yahweh, this God, is declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure because I'm God. I'll call a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly I have spoken and truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it and surely I will do it. This is the sovereign one. This is the God over all and here in Philippians, Paul is saying, God has given that name upon Christ, the name which is above every name. And what blows me away, Paul's saying this name is Christ. He's the one that this passage is referring to. Here is his divinity exalted. And so all will be humbled before this Christ, the kurios, all the world is moving to this day where Christ is going to return, not as a lamb, but as the Lion of Judah. And he will not come this time to be humiliated. He won't come to be put to death as a lamb led to the slaughter. But he will come to throw down every enemy and throw into eternal hell and eternal heaven his people. Now he's going to come and he'll be revealed in all of his glory, and it'll be kurios. And all will, all will bow and say, this is the Lord. There'll be those by sovereign grace that he made willing to bow to this Christ and believe even this morning in this room. And when he comes, they're going to do this in worship as the whole cosmos is made right again from the fall. 
and we will worship Christ for this salvation. And others are going to bow by force, and they're going to acknowledge that he's Lord. He's gonna, they're going to acknowledge it. In bag, it says it means to confess or to acknowledge or to openly declare. The whole universe is going to declare that he's kurios. And it's going to be those who are in heaven, those on the earth, and those under the earth. It's a way of saying everyone. And so the climax of this world is kurios returns, and everything created will bow to the creator, the Lord. In Revelation 5.13, I'll read it again. Every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And this glory will rule and reign and be worshiped in glory forever. So what is going on here this morning? The one who was humiliated to the lowest place that you could go on our behalf for the glory of his Father has been exalted above all names. And he's given the name Kurios. And one day the whole universe will bow to this name and worship and acknowledge that he is Lord. And we live in a world now that is so smug and taking that name in vain and laughing and mocking at those who worship it. And there's coming a day where every tongue, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that there is salvation in no other name. We'll either be saved or shamed and damned for all of eternity. The demarcation of all of humanity in that day is what did you do with the Lord Jesus Christ while you lived on this earth? What have you done with this Christ? Is he just someone that tucks you in at night? Someone that's a nice story, a moral fable? Or is he curious, who humbled himself to the point of our redemption and our salvation? And now he is above every name and he's the Lord. And I've come and I've bowed my knee to this Christ. I've surrendered now so that when he comes back, I'll worship when I see Kurios, instead of shrink away and try to hide under rocks and be cast into the eternal damnation. Once again, I hold to you, Jesus Christ. That day is a coming, and you can put your fingers in your ears and say, ooh, I can't hear you. Let me get out of here. This guy's crazy. This day is coming, and you cannot put it off, ignore it, or make it go away. The only thing you can do is be ready by repenting and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and coming under that refuge and that salvation that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the purpose of his exaltation? We've seen the source is the Father. The gift is the name above every name. The response to his salvation is that everything created will bow to the King, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And now we move to the purpose. Why did God do this? Come with me to verse 11. He did this so that every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This whole thing is so that the Father will be glorified by his plan and what he has done in giving his Son for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish on that day but have everlasting life. This is all to the glory of God the Father. This salvation, this plan, this redemptive history, this finish, it just emanates with the glory of God. Glory, 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 hallelujah to the God who saves. And God has said, my glory, I will not give to another. Quit thieving. And how do you look at this plan and, and want to give glory to yourself? There's only one place that all of history moves to, and it's all the glory to this great God. 
The glory you are seeking to steal from God is the greatest sin that there is. This all exists for him and rightfully so. And we have a calling to exalt this glory while we breathe, not ours. And so there's a freedom in the gospel to be sons and daughters of God who image forth the glory of God. We reflect his glory and shine it forth in the salvation that he's given to us and the beauty of what he's done in our hearts. He's subdued these hearts under his lordship. And so let's come and pull, pull this all back into what Paul is going after. And as I look at this, there's this quote I heard. This is what I call cracking a nut with a sledgehammer. <laughs> the, the nut is disunity with pride. And, and Paul comes in and, and the sledgehammer are the greatest truths that we've ever known that he existed in the form of God and he humbled himself to the point of death on a cross and he's been exalted above every name. This is the highest peak and points that there are in the history of this world and in Christianity. And Paul pulls that out to crack this nut. So to Paul uh, and thus the Holy Spirit, selfish ambition is breaking the unity of the Spirit and it's no small thing. I still think we think it's small. And for Paul, this isn't small. This is breaking the whole purpose of the church, giving God glory by all walks of life being unified in this gospel. It shows forth his name, his nature, his plan, his character. And when I come out from under that for my own selfish stuff and my self-glory, the sledgehammer comes out. Boom! Crack this heart, this prideful, selfish heart that wants glory. And we'll break up the body of Christ so that something else will get preeminence versus Christ. This is big. It's not small. <laughs> Living a life of just looking out for your own interests is so contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ that he gets the sledgehammer out to say, you're not going to live that way. You're not going to spend all your day saying, hey, I'm a Christian now. I'm not going to hell anymore. I'm going to heaven. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life just living out for me, looking out for number one, ignoring everybody else. He says, no, that isn't Christianity. It's so contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the gift of God, faith, that looks its eyes out at Jesus. And you look at his humiliation and you're just like, I'm dead. I'm crucified. I, I die when he died in my behalf. I look at that and, and I just die. And I look at this exaltation this morning. He's been lifted up. And it's to produce humility. Humility. And it says, I, I love you. I love you and I will lay my life down for others the way you did. You emptied yourself and what you did for us to redeem us. I'll go do the same. I'll follow in your footsteps, my life for yours. That's the response to the gospel. And I want you to get this. This is the principle of the kingdom of God. There's humiliation on this earth and this life. And God will exalt you when you finish. Humble yourselves. And this is this season of humiliation. As a pastor, it breaks my heart. I just watch it. He's bringing humiliation into every one of your lives. It just, he just keeps clipping you in different things, in different ways, in different idols. And, and, and if I had to describe every life in here, it's humiliation. The God of the universe is bringing us down the path of humiliation. And in his time, he's going to exalt you. Do you think he knows how to do that? <laughs> Look what he did to the son. He knows how to take his children and exalt them on the last day. You're already seated with Christ in the heavenly places this morning, spiritually and positionally. You already have a name above every name on this earth. You got a better name than the, the Tesla guy, Gates, Trump, uh, Biden. Um, you, you already got a name above all of them. You're a child of God. <laughs> You're a child of God. How weighty is that? I'll take that over anything some billionaire has. I look at them and laugh. I don't want that. I'm a child of the, of the living God. I have everything. So I want you to get this because there's somewhere the church lost this message. And we started saying, come to Jesus 
and you'll have health and you're going to have wealth and prosperity. You're going to live your best life now. I, I say garbage, just a lie. That isn't what's going to happen. <clears throat> you're going to have a life of humiliation as a child of God and he's going to humble you and he's going to bring you low and you're going to live in a world that's going to spit you out and hate you and reject you and you're going to suffer and you're going to have trials and tribulations. And Jesus said, take heart for I've overcome the world. And at the end of this life, he's going to exalt you. You're going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And so humble yourselves and let God exalt you, not you as the message of Philippians. Your calling isn't to exalt you. That's self-glory. That is not why you're alive. This is not fighting for your rights and your privileges and your name. If you exalt yourself, you're going to be humbled. In Matthew and twice in Luke, Jesus said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Peter said, humble yourselves, and it's passive. Allow yourselves the humiliations of life that God brings into your life. Allow them. Why? They're under the mighty hand of God. They're all from God's hand for your good. Allow them so that he may exalt you at the proper time. And that word means to put on display for his glory. And so at the proper time, he's going to lift you up and use you for his glory, not for yours. And so that makes me anxious. Well, cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Be sober in spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. They're all facing humiliations. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. God is opposed to the proud. He stands in battle array against us, but he gives grace to the humble. So do you get this? Let the gospel break in. Look at Jesus and his humiliation and his exaltation. And as you have this mind, you are freed and you are empowered to forget this deadly life that seeks for self and never gets it, to joyfully lay down your life for others, to take up the towel in the basin, and to wash each other's feet to give yourself away, to not break the unity by your desires, your hurts, your lack of appreciation, your sliding, your slandering, your trying to bring others below you. Stop. This life will bring humiliation. And that has just been my, my journey. And he just keeps bringing it. But to persevere in well-doing, and at the proper time, God will lift you up and give you so much that words can, will come short, short of it. An eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. Romans 2, you'll receive glory and honor and peace. Oh, what God has prepared for you. You'll be made like him and you'll shine like the sun in righteousness where every day is better than the last. Our humility and our unity hand in hand, serving one another in our humiliations and helping each other with them, walking together to glory to receive the unimaginable things that God has laid up for you. And now hold all your hurts next to that and let them have the right place and let Christ have the center place. To God be the glory. Have you bowed to this Christ. I don't care if you've been in this church for all 25 years since we started. Have you bowed to Kurios? 
And the way you know is you're a bondservant of Christ now that says, my life for yours. I was thinking of, I've been doing a bunch of weddings lately, and I just come back to that Ephesians 5. Why did, why did, how did Jesus use his headship? And it says that husbands are given headship in a marriage. And the reason Jesus had this headship, we just watched, it, it, he emptied himself. And he humbled himself, and he came, and he laid his life out for his bride. And so husbands, it's not to be King Tut. I want you to get this. You have headship to come low and come into your families and love and wash feet and nurture and take care of those little brides and lay your lives down for them. There's this teaching going around in the church that's just garbage that wives are these little slaves or something. They're precious and they're treasures and we're to serve them with the leadership like Christ did for us. Elders and deacons, you have authority to come wash feet and serve the body of Christ. I just wonder if some of you ever one time covered someone's sin? Just 1 Corinthians 6, why not be wronged or defrauded? Have you ever been wronged? Or you, it's just your whole life. I meet people like this all the time. It's about your rights, your rights, your rights, and you'll blow up the body of Christ for your rights. Have you ever in humility just loved somebody or wronged? Didn't run away and worked through reconciliation? That's what this is getting at. It's this, this mindset of Christ is that we would have humility with one another and enter in and love and put Jesus Christ on display by the unity that we have in this gospel. And, and how do you look at Jesus and not say that's bigger than every wrong, every hurt, everything I've ever faced? There's something so much bigger at stake and, and God cares that's why he took the sledgehammer to our pride. And so I pray that God would humble us. So let's go to the table and remember the place where selfish ambition dies as we look at Christ dying in our place, the highest one. That'll, that, that'll get your glory in the right place. This one, Jesus Christ, the Lord. Let's look our eyes out and let's put him where he belongs till we quit looking out merely for our own interests, but for the interests of others. Let's pray. Father, bring repentance. I just see some haughtiness just even as I'm preaching. God, break it. Let him not resist the word of God. If it's a whole lifetime of just being prideful and arrogant and broken relationships, just follow their whole life. God, let this morning be the freedom that breaks in, causes them to go low and start loving and washing feet and serving people and their own agendas become second or third. God, do that work in the hearts of your children. God, I pray for those who have already bowed their knee to kurios. God, help us to keep growing, to surrender everything to this sweet Christ. He's worthy of all. Lord, we, we fight and we resist. Help us, subdue us. Let us uh, receive the humiliations of life. And we look for that day when you will lift us up from this low place and we will be made like the bright lights of children of the sons of daughters of God. Oh, Lord, we look for that day. But this is the time of humiliation. This is the time of sacrifice and service. God, let that break into every heart as they stare at Jesus. What an example. Let us have that mindset which was in him. God, every mindset that's not that, would you renew our minds this morning in the truth? Would you set us free from whatever it is that's keeping us from that mindset? God, I pray that the unity in this church will show forth the gospel of Jesus Christ and many will be brought to him and worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
God, thank you for this glorious passage. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.